rowdiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Fogel. There are several ways to consider the moon over Broadway. It depends upon your job or the company you keep. You can hold somebody's hand and point to it. You can stand on a street corner and sneer at it. Or you can do it the way I did. Stick your head out of the window at police headquarters and try to focus through the haze laid down by the neon. I had just about focused when the interruption came. My name's Goodwin. They said walk right in. All right. Close the door. I never saw such a sight in all my life. Sit down, Mr. Goodwin. You really expect me to sit down after what I just saw? You really do? What did you see? A murder with my own two eyes. Uh, sit down, Mr. Goodwin. You don't believe me, do you? I'll tell you, Mr. Goodwin, the statistics are against you. We get a dozen calls a day from eyewitnesses to murders. You see, I told you. Mostly they turn out to be nothing at all. Drunks, uh, that sort of thing. I saw a murder. I saw a man strangle a woman. I saw his face. I saw her face. He was furious. She was dying. I saw it. Now, don't tell me to sit down, either. Uh, tell me about it. From the bus. The Acme sightseeing to look to it. I got there early, so I got a seat near the window. What are you talking about, Mr. Goodwin? The sightseeing bus. I had a seat by the window. That's how I saw it. Go ahead. We had just left Chinatown. That was part of the tour. I didn't like Chinatown. It was murky and oriental and made me feel finicky. Go ahead, Mr. Goodwin. We left Chinatown, and we were riding along. I was watching the street signs go by, you know, 31st Street, 32nd Street, 33rd Street. I do that myself, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, go ahead. Well, around about 35th Street and 1st Avenue, I saw a murder. Go ahead. It, it was in one of those houses, and I remember to observe something. And what was that? The house was on the right-hand side of the street going north. What did you do when you saw this murder, Mr. Goodwin? What does a responsible citizen do when he sees a murder while he's riding on a bus? He tells the bus driver. And what did the bus driver tell you? Exactly what an irresponsible bus driver always does. He said he had a schedule to keep. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Goodman. Danny Clover speaking. Danny Muggerman. Uh, what's on your mind? Downtown, Danny. Girl's been strangled. Huh? Where? 2416 First Avenue near 35th. Second house in the corner. On the right-hand side, going north. Yeah. Where are you? Back here, Danny, in the bedroom. Oh, hi, Danny. In here. That overstuffed chair facing the window. I see it. Yeah. What's that, my room? People upstairs, noisy type, noisy plumbing. And another kid bouncing a ball on the floor. Sounds like a ball. Strangled. The bruises on her throat. Ripped dress. She's just a kid. 18. Music student from London, Iowa. He saw this can in the front room. Yeah. Who was she, Michael? Kid who came to the big city to study music. Been here a month. Name of Ann Cornell. Anything? Nothing, Danny. Hmm, the ball game's over. Two letters from home, Danny. Pictures of her mother and father. A couple of dresses. Coats in the closet. All the ordinary things for a girl from a small town. Uh, maybe the boys from technical. How do you do it? How? How do you stand over a dead girl and haggle over a death? Tell me. How do you do it? Because I want to know. Mother, he called us, Danny. He uh, says his name is Sandy McKay. Says he found a girl like that. You knew Ann, Sandy? Oh, get out. Please get out. Leave me alone with Ann. Just for a while. So many things that I never told her. Just for a while, please. How old are you, Sandy? Oh, get out. Sandy, 19? <laughs> help us, Sandy. We want to find Ann's murderer. You'll help us do that, won't you, Sandy? What does it matter? She's dead. Anne's dead. You knew her back home in Iowa? No. No. Where? Where did you meet Anne? Through friends? Someone? It was... It was at school. I was walking down a hall, and I saw her in one of the classrooms. I just went right in, right up to her, and talked to her. Everybody laughed. What school, Sandy? The Spence School of Music. She was studying piano there. My, my family wants me to be a musician. I hate it. But it was all right. 
because all of a sudden there was Anne in a room. You found her here like this. Tell me about that, Sandy. We had a date. When I knocked, she didn't answer. And I called, and still she didn't answer. Hmm? And then the door just opened. I guess it was a draft someplace. It just opened. So I came in and... and... Oh, Anne! Hey! Ah! Hey, don't touch her! Leave him alone, Margaret. Leave him alone. <laughs> After that, the technical squad arrived, very efficient with their cameras, their dusting powder, and their little black books. Some time after that, they took Sandy McKay down to headquarters for further questioning. Then I went home to sleep. The next morning, I walked down Broadway, turned left two blocks, and found myself in front of a tired building that has a lot of names. You take your choice. You walk up four flights, and you get four offers. You're perfect for a fairy tale ballet that's opening in New York. You make a stunning cover on a muscle magazine. You can play ukulele with a college boy combo in Atlantic City. Have you got a song that's trying to be published? All with a slight fee, of course. And on the fifth floor, you find what you're looking for. Alonzo and Blank Spence, School of Music. Learn as you learn. I went in. I beg your pardon, I... All right. Oh, trumpet playing like that gives me pimples. I don't know why, but... My name's Danny Clover. Danny Clover? Oh, you don't have to worry about that. We'll think of a fine name for you. Something that'll look good in life. Alonzo? Alonzo? Yeah, 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 yeah. What is it, Blanche? Oh, another student, huh? <laughs> What's your name, young fellow? He told me Danny Clover. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. I'm from the police. Oh, the police band, huh? Well, let's hold that for a little while. I want to talk to you about one of your pupils. Brass or string? And Cornell. Tell me about her. A very talented girl. Oh, she is a nothing. I don't care about her talent, Mr. Spence. I've come to tell you she's dead. I said she's dead. But how? Yesterday she was here. How? Murdered. Uh, strangled. Oh, oh, poor, poor girl. Oh, I'm sorry what I said. Truly, I'm sorry. You said she was here yesterday, Mrs. Spence. At what time? In the afternoon, as usual. Every day, Mr. Clover. She was a talented girl. Oh, she really was, Mr. Clover. Did you notice anything about her yesterday? That she was happy since that boy... Sandy McKay? Yes. Since he walked into her classroom one day and started to talk to her. Since then, so happy. It showed her face, music. Oh, who'd want to kill her? We're trying to find that out. We'll help, won't we, Alonzo? Oh, of course. Anne Cornell enrolled a month ago. Uh, paid for her tuition in advance. Uh, she, she came from... Uh, London, Iowa. London, Iowa. Thank you, Blanche. She came regularly for her instructions. Uh, she met Sandy McKay. She seemed happy. Oh, what else? Why, well, well, that's all we know of her, Mr. Clover. Nothing more than that. Nothing at all. Charles play I play with the Tartaglia Bloodhound Giuseppe. They always get the laugh. Oh? <laughs> when the Tartaglia Bloodhound responds to my humor like that, I just gotta up his rational strong heart. Ah, I don't know, Danny. That dog. He just wraps me around his third finger. <laughs> Last night... Uh, whenever he... you finish laughing, Tartaglia. Uh, uh-huh. Oh, oh, I'm finished, Danny. Uh, the next item on the agenda, Danny, is... Danny, I apologize for being funny, so kill me. I may. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Well, uh, the next item on the agenda, to wit. The police department of London, Iowa, have graciously completed our files on the deceased Anne Cornell. You will tell me about it, Arthur, thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure, Danny. Anne Cornell was indeed 18 years old. Did indeed come here to study the piano. Was from a respectable Iowa family, uh, indeed. Never a mark against the girl. Loved and respected by all and sundry. Eh, uh, I guess it's a big tragedy in our hometown, Danny. Where isn't it? What else did I do? Three uh, reports from technical. They went over the girl's room with a fine-tooth comb, claw and mail. Nothing. 
Nothing that didn't have a reason for being there. Fingerprints? The hers, the boys, Sandy McKay. And the set identified as belonging to the landlady who has ten fingers and an airtight alibi. Nothing. Well, I told you, Danny. In these departments, nothing. But in another department, something. Yeah, yeah, it could possibly be something. You'll share it with me, Tataglia. Oh, Danny, why should I share? It belongs to you. While you were out, the phone call came in. I have the transcript here. I'll just tell it. It's from a Mrs. Doris Beeler. Friend of yours, Danny? Never heard the name before. What did she want? Oh, she sounded like a nice lady. She says if you will come to her apartment hotel, the Jackson, on West 87th, she she'll will... Tell what, Tataglia? She will tell you about the murderer of Anne Cornell. <laughs> Yes. Mrs. Beeler? Mrs. Doris Beeler? Yes. What do you want, young man? I'm from the police, Mrs. Beeler. Danny Clover. I had word that you called. Oh, yes. Please come in, Mr. Clover. Thank you. Always in your city. There's so long and dark. No windows. I suppose it's because there's so little room to spread out here. This is my first time here, Mr. Clover. Oh? Yes. I'm from Iowa. I've never been away from home in my life. Except once when I was a little girl. Oh, um, please sit down, Mr. Clover. Thank you. You'll find that chair the most comfortable. And they're all so rocky, but... Uh... You're from Iowa, Mr. Beeler. From London, Iowa? Why, yes, from London, Iowa. Born and raised there. And married there. To Mr. Beeler. I'm a teacher in London, Iowa. But how did you know? They told me over the phone you could tell me about Anne Cornell's murderer. Oh, yes. I can, Mr. Clover. I can. <laughs> Oh, it's just the doorbell. I'll go see who it is and send him away, Mr. Clover. I'll only be a minute. Yes? Oh. <laughs> Mrs. Beeler! Mrs. Beeler! Mrs. Beeler, what happened? I can't. something serene in her face, a serenity that denied the spectacle violent death that made of her, that closed her eyes against the blood that soiled her clean dress, her going away dress. And that was all, the silent corridor receiving her death, and the serenity, nothing else. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. There's this about Broadway it'll lay you odds on anything. The girl walking towards you will smile, two to one. Sorry, kid, you lose that one. But you're welcome to try again. The little guy eyeing the dancers on the spectacular. Three to five, he got lost in Dream Alley and can't go home. Uh Uh-uh. No play. No? Here's a good one, kid. A parlay on murder. Eighteen-year-old girl studied music. Strangled. A woman shot down because she opened the door. And both from a whistle stop called London, Iowa. Clever, huh, kid? Make your play any way you want And at headquarters the next day, a man has been trying to tilt the odds in your favor. You haven't listened to a word I said, Mr. Clover. All I ask of you is that you listen. All right, Mr. Goodman, I'll listen. You were saying... Now, see, you haven't heard a word. Do you want to solve the murder of that poor little girl I saw being strangled? Do you really want to... What is it you want to tell me, Mr. Goodman, that you've solved the murder? Practically, practically. It was I who saw the deed. In the excitement of revealing the crime to you, I... I completely forgot the most important detail, the most lurid detail. And that is? The man who was strangling that girl wore eyeglasses. Thick eyeglasses. There, Mr. Clover, it's all yours. Tataglia. Tataglia. Uh, Yeah, Danny. I am at your beck and call. Uh, Oh, you got company. The company's leaving, Sergeant. Will you hold the door open for him? Goodbye, Mr. Goodwin. Uh, See here, you 
can't just dismiss. Goodbye, Mr. Goodwin. <laughs> That's the thanks I get. Well, it takes all kinds to make a world, I always say. Goodbye, Mr. Goodwin. Whenever you're in the neighborhood, stop in to see it. Hmm. I said something wrong, then? All right, so I apologize. Don't stand there biting my head off without opening your mouth. What have you got on Mrs. Beeler? Oh, oh, thanks, Danny. Mrs. Beeler, here we check the elevator, boy, desk clerk. Nobody asked for her while you were in her apartment talking to her. Nobody went up even to that floor. They know because it's very quiet that time of day in that hotel. The other exit? Check, Danny. There's a service entrance in the back. Nobody saw nobody come in or go out. Mostly because they didn't bother to care if anybody came in or out. They admit the possibility that somebody might have, but then... All uh... right, all right. Well, Danny, you yourself asked me. I hate myself for it. What do you got on Mrs. Felix from the London, Iowa police? Well, what I expected, that she was a nice lady, known and respected by her neighbors... She was married to a Mr. George Beeler, a music teacher, who is at present out of town from London, Iowa. Mm -hmm. Oh, Danny, those small towns. You know, there's something so peaceful about them. And many times have Mrs. Tartaglia and I entertained the wanderlust to go to such a town. We Tartaglia. even... Tartaglia. Uh, uh, yeah, Danny? You think the wanderlust can lead you back to your desk? Huh? Oh, I think it can. Go on, try it, Tartaglia. And close the door gently on your way out. Roger. Okay. There was nothing to do after that except think about it. And the process didn't lend itself well to the old familiar scars and the gently falling dust of police headquarters. I went outside. I almost made it to the sidewalks of the civilians. Officer Corio leaned toward me. Hey, Danny. Yeah? What do you want? Come on, Danny. Come inside. 34th Street, East Side. Right in the subway. <laughs> magazine stand. Three policemen in uniform held back a crowd whose face looked like it had a veil drawn over it. And the train, the subway trains and the soft clucking of the mob, a man in a brown ready-made suit shouldered his way. All right, Danny. Here, come on. Hold my hand. I'll get you through this barrier of curious onlookers. What happened, Muggerman? Uh, a guy stretched out on the bench. It happened to him. Well, what did? And he was pushed into the side of a moving subway train. Witnesses? Yeah, that lady with the bundles, the brown paper bag. Uh-huh. Uh, brief me, Mother. Well, according to her, she just put a dime in a turnstile. She sees this man here standing near the edge of the platform reading the newspaper. And all of a sudden... Uh, did you hear me, Dan? Yeah, try it again. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyhow, a guy walked up and back and pushed him against the train. The guy ran before anyone knew what happened. The man on the bench, identification? Oh, yeah, plenty of that. Uh, hotel key, driver's license, social security card, large cards. It works. Okay. Who is it? Uh, uh, go right here. Uh, name is uh, Arthur Walker, a traveling salesman of shoes, employed by the Black Parrot Shoe Company. A letter in his pocket indicates he was here in a buying trip. Where did he check in? Uh, anything on that? Uh, yeah. Uh, Vickers Hotel on 47th Street. I know the place, Dan. It's respectable. Did you find out where this Arthur Walker came from? I've been itching for you to ask me, Andy. Arthur Walker came from London, Iowa. I beg your pardon, I'm what... sorry, sir. We can't register you with our baggage, unless, of course, you pay in advance. You can do that? Uh, I can do even better. Look. Oh, a policeman? Uh, that's what the badge says, doesn't it? I'm quite nearsighted. You might be from the gas company. Yeah, I might. You're the guest here. Arthur Walker. Oh, he's one of most mild, most desirable clients, Mr. Walker is. Whenever he makes a buying trip to New York, he comes to our hospital in the Vickers, in the Vickers chain. Had a guess. But we still had him. No, he's dead. Murdered. But that's shocking. Positively shocking. Poor oh, Mr. Walker. He was always so generous. Never said goodbye without money in his palm, never. Tell me more about him. Oh, he was a shoe salesman. He gave me a sample pair once. His demands were polite, modest. Only once did he call on me, the manager, personally. What did he call on you for? For a ridiculous tourist type of thing. 
He wanted me to arrange a ticket for him on some Acme sightseeing tour. A sophisticated man like Mr. Walker in shoes and so on. Well, when was this? Hmm? The tour. When was it? Let me see. Why, uh, it was the day before yesterday. That's it, the day before. Anything else? Nothing. Uh, except your carnations, wilted manager. <laughs> Hey, Danny, I'm enjoying myself. Yeah, I'm glad you are, Mugovan. This Acme bus tour up nooks and down the crannies of old Manhattan is a revelation to me. I'm enjoying it, but I don't get it. Two men we know of took this ride. One saw a murder. Another got pushed in front of a subway train. Maybe someone... Somewhere... All right, ladies and gentlemen, we see the edifice known as the Radio City Music Hall. The fact to remember about this place is that in the lobby... There is a mechanical boy that once an hour sings the song of the Mexican Nightingale, the original Spanish language. Also in the lobby, there are many... It is possible to negotiate for the purchase of Florida Pompano, lump crab meat, jumbo shrimp. It's just a coincidence, Danny. What can happen on a sightseeing tour has to do with two murders. I don't know. Maybe just what you said, a coincidence. On either side of the street, ladies and gentlemen, we present the Bowery. Where the blossom meets the jessup. All out, all out for three me, three me, three me, three We will have a 30 minute stop over here. We too, then? Sure. No, no, I want all of us to sit together in our little party. Acme Tours, by special arrangement with the shopkeepers of Chinatown, has arranged a delightful side tour, during which you will be able to buy valuable and rare examples of Oriental art at wholesale prices. Please follow me. We too, then? Uh, just you, Margaret. Huh? Uh-huh. How long do you think it would take to get over to the house where Ann Cornell was strangled to First Avenue and 35th? Uh, by subway? Maybe seven minutes? Yeah, about that. That'll give a sightseer plenty of time to commit a murder and get back here to become a sightseer again. Wouldn't it, Markovan? Huh? Wouldn't it, Markovan? Enjoy Chinatown, kid. I'm going to try it. Markovan was wrong. The trip took eight minutes. But on the way up to Ann Cornell's room, there was a delay. A woman who told me she was the manager asked me what I wanted. I said the room of Ann Cornell and showed her my badge to underline the point. She said Miss Cornell's room had been rented to a piano teacher because it had a piano in it. She said, listen. Then she said, see? I did. The music teacher sat there, his fingers moving over the keys of the standard upright. should be played at. See? I'll play it again. Now, watch my right hand. I didn't know you were a piano teacher, Mr. Goodwin. Mr. Goodwin. Mr. Goodwin. No one by the name of Goodwin is here. What do you mean by interrupting this lesson? Get out of here. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were giving a lesson, Mr. Beeler. That's right, isn't it? You are Mr. Beeler. Pay no attention to a man. Here, now, I'll show you once more. I want you for murder. Mr. Beeler. You 
understand why I had to kill my wife, don't you, Anne? She followed me here. She didn't want me to love you. And Arthur Walker, why did you kill him? Please. Why did you kill him, Mr. Bill? I had to. Back home, it was scandal, Anne and I. That's why you went away from me, wasn't it, Anne? Arthur Walker, Mr. Bill. Oh, I had to kill him. He was in New York selling shoes. Yeah, he was also on the Acme sightseeing tour with you. Of course he was. Then he read in the newspaper about my wife's death. He knew you killed her, didn't he? Yes. What about Anne? Mr. Walker remembered he missed me all the while the bus stopped in Chinatown. He didn't see me again until the bus was ready to leave. Then Walker did just what I did. Retraced his steps. And you killed him in the subway. He found out about Anne. When he read that Anne was dead. Dead? Oh. Oh, but you're not dead, Anne. You're not. Now, listen, listen to me. I didn't mean it. You made me angry. You ran away from me, and then I came to you, and you tried to run away again, and I I had to keep you here. I didn't mean to hurt you, Anne. 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 Anne, play, play. Here, here, I'll show you. I'll show you how. His fingers ripped the ugly sounds and hurled them against the fact of Anne's death. Again. 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 Then the thread that bound his sanity gave way. And there was a secret smile on his face. He knew Anne was sitting beside stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Curry. Included in tonight's cast were Joseph Kearns, Norma Varden, Florence Ravenel, Jack Crucian, Sam Edwards, and Bert Holland. (laughs) 